Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Tom Wells here. Today is Friday, May the 11th, 2018, 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Your first daily dose of happy for the day. Happy Friday, everybody. We got through the week. It's a good week. It's a good weekend coming up. Weather is beautiful here in uh, North America and, you know, all's right with the world. That's the way I look at it. How's it going in your your neck of the woods? You're at the other neck of the woods from me. I'm in the eastern neck. You're in the western (laughs) neck. Well, it's a beautiful spring. It hasn't getting, gotten too hot yet. We got our, our high so far for the year has been 85. I know you were saying you had a 99 there. But, yeah, that um, was an outlier. <laughs> yeah, but it's totally beautiful. It's incredible to see so much green sprouting and so oh, yeah. much beauty everywhere. I love this time of year. Exactly. Oh, yeah. We, we were just commenting on that yesterday. We We went out to dinner last night, and as we came to the the first traffic light that comes out of our complex which there's a mountain a very small mountain by colorado standards but it's a mountain in front of us and it's just green 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 as far as the eye can see and louise was saying wow look what a little rain will do (laughs) yeah 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 we need a little bit more but we're supposed to get some this weekend possibly so that's great Mm -hmm. oh yeah that was the other thing about yesterday louise's uh weather wish is always to have nice comfortable sunny days during the day so that her gardeners can do their work and then let it rain at night and that's exactly what we got last night so hey the weather's cooperating it's a good Mm, thing life is good great yeah so well today yeah go ahead i guess we're going to talk a little bit more about this book yeah um and this concept of uh, asking for help from the divine realm the unseen realm the celestial realm whatever you want to call it Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, it's, and I said in the introduction to this program today that this might not be for everybody because, you know, not everyone thinks in these terms of, uh, there being such a thing as a, uh, an unseen realm that we can call on for help. I mean, it is kind of prevalent in the religions of the world, (laughs) obviously, that you're asking for help from some being that we might call God or Yahweh or whoever, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Allah. Um, Allah. There are so many. Um, and that's a huge idea in the world. It's mm-hmm. vast. And yet, um, in the law of attraction and the realm of this program here, where we're talking about law of attraction all the time, how do you ask for help from that realm? Of course, when you look at law of attraction, it's entirely based on that premise that, uh, oh, yeah. that the, second you're, the second you put out a desire that uh, into the universe, into your life that immediately it's answered Mm -hmm. and that as soon as it's answered, then all your job is, is to relax, let it all come about. And you watch as the, uh, as the things happen in your life and you take action based on the impulses you get from source in the unseen realm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and basically it's, it's really not on your shoulders to worry about anything. What's really your job is to, is to chill out and let and let things unfold for you in a beautiful way and to sort of give up the idea that your life is a stressful event that it's all on you and that you're completely alone here and i've gone through a lot of this feeling this uh, i still go through it sometimes well yeah. sure i think we all do I, well actually i was talking to you before the podcast how i'd seen an article uh blue Pl- blue cross blue shield the health provider uh put out a report in the last few days that uh, clinical depression is on the rise in a big way here in the U.S. and probably also around the world. Um, over the last five years, it has increased 33%. It's a gigantic increase. So, yeah, the the need for addressing this kind of thing is, is even more heightened than it used to be. It's very, very important. So I'm glad we're doing this. This is a good topic. Yeah. And I was telling you about how, how uh, I just read a report from National Geographic about how there's this fast rise in the amount of amphibians that are dying around the world from mm. salamanders to frogs. You know, they say that you can literally walk around the lakes in Switzerland and just see thousands and thousands of dead frogs mm, yeah. floating everywhere and down the rivers and streams. And well, this kind of thing could cause somebody to get depressed yeah, uh, and to sure. feel anyone who has an empathetic connection to the earth and watches things dying. It's very intense. I know it, this was huge for me and I know it could get, it could get big because it's hard not to be 
attached and connected to the things around us and the resilience of life. All we want to do is, and listen, all I want to do is to feel good about my life and to feel excited and expectant and hopeful about being here in a physical body and all the potential and beauty that could unfold. And yet when we see things that are that are frightening or otherwise um, upsetting, you know, it, it can be, it can be weird and oh, yeah. scary and sad, you know, make us sad maybe. And so what do we do about all that? <laughs> and uh, what <laughs> well, do we part- do about if we're feeling depressed, you know? Well, that's part of what we talk about every day, all the different ways yeah. to work on our own positivity, getting past stuff, getting limitations out of the way, attracting what we want into our lives and so on and so forth. And uh, the topic you came up with, for us to talk about today is a really good way to to start that process uh, because Wendy Dillard likes to talk about it a lot. The, she likes to tell us stories about how you know day by day she's tapping into her inner being and what the latest conversation's been and so forth. So, mm. I mean, you're you're right into that same uh, realm with the topic that you brought up today. So let's dive in. What what does uh, our <laughs> author have to say on the topic? Yeah, I thought I would read a little bit from uh, her book, Hiring the Heavens, A Practical Guide to Developing Working Relationships with the Spirits of Creation by Gene Slatter. Um, Let's see, here we have chapter two uh, called Hiring in the Spiritual Realm. Just for fun, imagine that the spiritual world is every bit as diverse as our own physical world. Imagine that it possesses every personality, style, skill, interest, motivation, talent, and ability that we humans do. For example, here on Earth, we find people with all kinds of personality traits. Some are funny, some are analytical, some are spontaneous or assertive or efficient. We also find people with every possible talent, ability, and job description. Some are exceptional as teachers, some as negotiators, some as gardeners or counselors or child care providers. Now imagine that all of these characteristics and job descriptions also exist in the non-physical dimension, that every subject has a match in the spiritual realm. Science, mathematics, art, music, philosophy, construction, and every other possible arena all have their spiritual doubles. For a talent or ability to exist here on earth, its corresponding non-physical energy must also exist. Next, Imagine that this entire universe of celestial experts and attributes is yours for the asking. Excuse me. <clears throat> Imagine that the spirits of creation are standing ready to assist you in making your world. Believe that not only is the power to summon that creativity flowing through you, it is your divine right, divine assignment even, to wield it. I have seen what I've just described is true. How could this reality change your life? What if all these skills, traits, and talents were indeed at your fingertips? And she goes on to describe what she calls the universal yellow pages. And what I'm going to do is change like that. that to the universal I'm going to change pages. that to the universal internet, you know, search engine. Bring it up to date. Sure, why not? Yeah, yeah. Because some people listening might not even know what a yellow pages is. Back in the day, there was this thing <laughs> That's true. that you know people got every every year. They got this great big thick book delivered to their front door that was that had what was called the white pages and the yellow pages. The white pages was the phone numbers and addresses of everybody um, in the whole community you lived in, and the yellow pages was the usually thicker and it was the ads and the addresses and phone numbers of everybody who had a business in your area. So you could look up any kind of help service provider you wanted in this great big thing called the yellow pages. Now we all go to the internet for that and we do a search. So we're, so talking, see- we're talking now about doing a search on the spiritual Google, which we'll call Spoogle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, Spookle. Sp- yeah, Spook, Spookle. We're, we're, we're Spook. gonna, we're, Spookle, yeah, we're going to do a Spookle search. <laughs> <laughs> because it's full of spooks. Okay, let's go even further and imagine that each of us has access to the expansive, unabridged, revised every minute Spookle directory. <laughs> Next time you're in need of a special talent or skill, let your imagination do the walking. Whatever project or need you have, I invite you to open the universal Spookle search engine and choose the professionals with the perfect skills to assist you. If a talent or ability exists here on earth, the universal search engine has a section for it. 
In fact, even if you've never heard of anyone with the exact package of skills and traits you're looking for, you can be confident that somewhere in the universe, precisely what you need is lined up and ready to serve you, just waiting to be asked. Uh This concept is easy to work with because it utilizes a template you're already comfortable with. Your conscious mind is familiar with the process of turning on your computer and searching on Spookle or Google (laughs) and imagine you're doing the same thing in the non-physical dimension. It's a simple process. Suddenly connecting with spirit becomes as conceivable as any other endeavor. You create the thought, you bring in the talent, energy, and abilities when the request and then the request begins to fulfill itself. Contemplate for a moment how easily some things just fall into place as if they were meant to be, how chance meetings serendipitously occur as if written in a play. What about the way you sometimes get an impulse to go somewhere that puts you in the perfect place at the perfect time? Wouldn't it be wonderful to increase the frequency of these amazing so-called coincidences? That's what can happen every day when you go to your universal spookle search engine and let the (laughs) universe arrange and orchestrate the details of your intentions. Very nice. On the physical plane, we always seem to be dealing with limited resources, not enough money, not enough time, not enough people or experts. If we switch our perception to the universe, these restrictions don't apply. So just imagine that you have all the money, time, and resources in the world to hire whatever kind of assistance your mind can come up with. Let's say you're planning a trip to another country. I encourage you to think about the heavenly resource pool first and hire a spiritual travel agent and a spiritual activities coordinator to help make it the most enjoyable visit ever. But don't stop there. Remember, your invisible helpers can facilitate anything you think of. You can bring in a spiritual tour guide to show you around, a spiritual translator to bridge the language gap, and a spiritual comedian to make sure there's plenty of laughter during the trip. Likewise, if you want a new house, think heavens first and hire a spiritual real estate agent. Ready for a better job? Get some inspiration from a spiritual job hunter. Looking for a new car? Hire a spiritual car salesman. Feeling overextended? Ask for a spiritual time manager. Having trouble with your computer? Requisition a spiritual computer tutor to figure out how to solve the problem. Are you getting a feel for this? You can enhance every aspect of your life by tapping into the aptitudes of the universe. Help from the divine can facilitate everything you do. Think heaven first, and you'll thank the heavens. My guidance wants you to know that there are thousands of unemployed angels. Don't ever think your problem is too trivial for you to call upon divine assistance. Don't ever think you might be bothering the celestial helpers. You're not bothering them. You're giving them a job. Think of the world of spirit as someone you can talk to about anything or nothing in particular. There's no reason to put on airs or speak in a stiff, formal voice. Spirit knows you. Spirit knows you. Be real, be spontaneous, be silly, be anything that makes you feel close to this incredibly warm and loving energy. Know that spirit is honored to be included in every detail of your life. Truly, this is where you'll find unconditional love and the best friend you could ever have. So that's the... It's quite an introduction. Yeah, I like the the way yeah. you substituted Spoogle in there. That was really good, I have to say. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a, I also have a question, too. Cause, and this has yeah. always been my most difficult part. I don't have yeah. any trouble putting out the request for information. My problem is that my browser doesn't always pre- present the results for me. How do I deal with that? <laughs> <laughs> you don't always see the results. Yeah. Well, you know... She has a whole section on that, and I could read a little bit from that. Um, Let's see. She talks about how there's a way to ask, and there's a way to receive. So um, you basically, let's see, she says... Remember that the key is intention. The first step is to ask, where have we heard that before? Mm -hmm. You know, the fantastic assistance of the universe will elude you unless you ask for it. Now you said you do do that. Oh yes. Ask with the intention. And of course, here's the, the key always and trust, of course, that the universe will support you. 
The door can then open wide for a serendipitous solu- solution to appear. Remember how uh, we always heard that Jesus said, knock and the door shall be opened to you. Ask and it shall be given to you. Mm-hmm. And they always thought, well, I guess you just have to trust <laughs> that if you ask and you knock, it's going to come. Don't, un- don't underestimate the power of the spoken word. Spoken word. Your request will hold more conviction if you say it out loud. Our okay. minds are full of endless chatter. Anyone tuning in would find it difficult to know when we really mean something and when it's just a lot of jumbled rambling in our heads. Good point. Using, using our voice helps us get our own attention and focus on what it is we really want. If we, I find that when we speak out loud, my sentence that when I speak out loud, my sentences are far more coherent. I imagine a presence and intelligent energy listening as I explain my request. I don't picture this energy as a person or give it a personal name, but you might like to try that. Do whatever works best for you. Don't waste even a minute feeling embarrassed. The universe finds nothing but delight in being involved with every endeavor in your life, and it enthusiastically waits to hear your thoughts and ideas. Here's something else to keep in mind. Like me, you may have read books and attended seminars that presented very definite rules about how to phase requests. But those rules don't apply here. When you employ the heavens, you can relax and just ask. No matter how you put it, you're not going to get it wrong. There's no test to see who can come up with the fanciest and most precise words. The last thing you want to do is create anxiety about how you're expressing yourself. Interesting point right there, because that's certainly something we could easily do, especially those among us who are of the perfectionist persuasion. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, because like she she gives the example of how people, you know, if you might just say, let's say you really like, you really want some chocolate and go, those chocolates are to die for. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Or you say, um, I'd sell my soul to have a house like that. Right. Um, And they say, oh, no, 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 I shouldn't say it that way. Oh, no, Some people are afraid (laughs) the universe will take us literally. She says, but this suggests that the universe in all its wisdom can't decipher the true meaning behind our figures of speech. If that were true, we would be creating disaster at every turn. My advice is don't buy into this belief system. Instead, picture the cosmic forces as loving friends who are easy to talk to, know exactly how you feel, and are hip to what you really mean, no matter what modern lingo you use. Um, For years, popular wisdom has advised us on the perfect way to say affirmations. The experts warn us against wanting. Warn us against wanting. They urge us to never say, I want a new house on a hill because the universe will supposedly match the vibration of our words and leave us eternally wanting, never having the house because we didn't speak it in an affirmative statement in present time. So we might have learned to say, I now enjoy my beautiful new house on a hill. That was the perfect mantra for success. But eventually I came to understand that far from being an obstacle, wanting is actually an essential element in the process of joyfully fulfilling our dreams. Wanting is the seed of desire, and without desire there can be no change, no growth, no creation. I realize that the universe actually celebrates whenever we identify something we want. Desire is the spark that ignites the force of creation. I'm here to give you permission to want all you want. Seed your dreams, embrace your wishes, and open yourself to the magic of your your desires. And don't forget to ask. And then you shall receive. This is the other half of the equation. Being open to receiving is just as important as asking. It seems silly to to point this out, but so many of us stop the flow at this place. We've all heard the saying, it's better to give than to receive. So we think that by refusing to receive, we're somehow being more righteous. The truth is that giving and receiving form a complete cycle. If we stop the flow of one, we stop the flow of the other. When the universe showers us with blessings, we must be in a state of gracious acceptance. If we decline, thinking that it's the virtuous thing to do, we halt the process and stifle our ability to give. Yeah, good points in there. I, I like uh, a couple of them in particular. Well, first of all, I like the the, um, the analogy about how you don't have to be particularly precise about how you express it, just as long as you express it out loud and, or at least clearly in some way. And it kind of reminds me of the Google search engine because we're making our little well, fun metaphor on it with, with the Spookle search engine, right? Well, with uh-huh. Google, Google has gotten to the point now where you don't have to be perfect with your re- request. You, you can kind of vaguely put in whatever it is that you're looking for, and, and Google will do its best to match up to what you've got as your, your keywords that you're entered. 
And uh -huh. all of a sudden it'll give you something like, oh, yeah, that's what I wanted. I couldn't remember what it was called, but it was called that. It's yeah. very good at doing that. Well, what uh, she's saying is that Spookle, the spiritual search engine, will do the same thing. And that's a very encouraging yeah. thing. Um, I forget what the other point was that I really liked. I, I, I wasn't taking notes, unfortunately. But the, um, the she was, let's see, after uh, she talked about that, she was talking about what? She was talking about, oh, um, how, uh, uh, about how you didn't have to worry about things like how you worded it, like wanting or whatever. And right, I thought that was interesting. That, that was interesting, the, very interesting. Yeah, I've, I've actually recently heard a a very high rolling law of attraction coach say that, you know, you don't, you know, say that exact thing. You don't want to get stuck in this always wanting something. You want to just move on as if you already have it. And there's a lot of, you know, talk out there. There's a lot of books and like especially Net, this guy Neville, who who was a uh, famous law of attraction early pioneer back Neville in Goddard. the fifty. Yeah. yeah, Neville Goddard, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And he talked about, you know, living completely in the in the place of already having the thing that you want. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was interesting that she, she takes on this playful attitude of, you know, that it's completely okay. The universe is always there at your beck and call. It's always hearing you. Um, there's always these um, entities or beings that are answering your, your requests. And for you, the whole thing is to, is to get into being able to receive it right. and to ask to ask for it in a comfortable way, and, and um, she she goes on to describe more about asking. So these are the real these are the real things. This next section, if you want me to read it, I don't know if it's or you want to discuss this for a while. But I, I just wanted to mention more about the wanting thing. Um, yeah, because then I, she talks about five or six other ways to yeah. to be more receptive. Okay. Well, we'll get to those. I, before we did, I just wanted to finish mm -hmm. off one thing about wanting. The The rule of thumb that I found that worked for me in terms of understanding this whole question about what words do you use is the recognition that they all have an emotional context. And yeah. the, the key is to understand what's your emotional context. If, if you're using the word wanting in a way that says, oh, I want that so much and I, I just don't have it. I, I, I feel the lack of it. Now, yeah. if that's what wanting means, then you're probably right to stay away from that one. But if wanting means, <laughs> oh, wow, I really want that. That would be so much fun. That would be so cool. If it feels good, if it's a good kind of wanting and like, yeah, I get excited about that, that's great. That works fine. And, and that's yeah. where I think the real definition and delineation – comes into play. It, it doesn't really matter what the word is. What matters is what is the general meaning of that word in the context of how you're feeling about the situation. If your feeling is yes. good, then, you know, it's like you said, I could, that, that's to die for. As long as you're saying that in a way that feels really good, like that, I don't really want to die. I just, I want to live this wonderful experience. Don't worry about the words. It's the feeling that counts. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if, if we have a charge, like, Esther uh, Abraham talked about this and we talked about it in a previous podcast about how do you um, channel? How do you, how do you let these entities or beings like Abraham speak through you mm. and come and, and they, and Esther was saying, or Abraham was saying through Esther that the reason Esther is so good at answering the questions of people that get into the chair and ask her questions is because she is, not attached to the, an emotional charge on any of the questions. Mm -hmm. Whereas the person in the chair usually is oh, yeah. got an emotional charge on it. And so in the channeling course that I took, the instructor uh, suggested that we write down questions that we have an emotional charge on um, maybe all in one place and in, in a, in a notebook or in some place that we're going to refer to later. And then, when we want to address those questions, let a day or two go by, then go back and address one of those questions when we've gone more general and we haven't, we're not feeling so much charge around mm. that particular thing that yeah. maybe it was a big charge on Monday, but by Wednesday, you know, when we want to channel and see what these spiritual beings and entities in this unseen realm want to tell us about how to deal with that situation, uh, we approach it maybe with less of a charge, and then there's more likely that we'll get uh, some clarity on it, mm, that some answer will come through. Because like you just said, the clarity that we want in our life comes through when we're in a place of receptivity. And and she lists about five or six ways in here to be in that place of receptivity, which is in a way when you think about every podcast we've done, 
that's what we're addressing, whether it's a podcast on how to have more, you know, how to be in a place of fun or I can't think of exactly the, all, all the titles we've had, but. Oh, there's hundreds really, of them, but I mean, group them generally. I mean, the topics about how to get more money, how to have better health, how to have better right. relationships. How to be in abundance. Yeah, right? all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. 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 Each, each topic is really asking us to consider how do we be in a place where we let in the result we want and where we also enjoy our journey so much that on one hand, we don't even, <laughs> we don't even care if we get the result. On the other hand, we're going to get the result. We're going to get the result. And it's awesome to get the result because we're in this place where we're so open and we're so receptive and we're so trusting and we're so in love with life. We're so happy that it, it, we can't help but have good things come to us. Mm, yeah. And that's kind of like the key to this whole thing. That's good stuff. So this is so, a way so, to actually ask directly and and then watch magic unfold. So I should probably said, read more of the stories that she tells. Because, yeah, we should. We should. You, you, you said she has six different, what are they, processes? Six different things that she was suggesting? Yeah, you guide, she calls them guidelines. guidelines? So keep in mind okay. when asking. She says they're, they're, they're not rules. Um, the essential part is to simply ask. Uh, but use these suggestions, these guidelines, as a framework within which you can seed and nourish your dreams. So the first one, as you might guess, is be playful. <laughs> Good one. I like that. Yeah. Keep a lighthearted and playful attitude. This life is a joyous creation meant to be celebrated and filled with a full spectrum of human experience. It shouldn't come as a, as a surprise to know that God or source really does want us to enjoy our lives. But the fact is, many people believe that life is meant to be hard. And again, this is the thing we come to in every podcast is that this is what we're up against is this old paradigm belief that life is meant to be a struggle mm -hmm. and that we're alone here. Yeah. Um, so people feel that life is a series of tests, a type of proving, proving ground where they try to earn God's favor. She talked earlier about how when we're little, you know, we have this uh, image of these giant parents and we need to earn their favor or we need to be, you know, we're completely dependent on them. Everything that we receive comes from our parents and everything we learn comes from our parents. And we have to request and, and behave. We learn to behave in a certain way. And then we get our parents to give us what we want, more love, more food, more whatever we, we really need and want comes by us being really good at receiving and then that was the image we got of God. You know, a lot of the traditional religions teach that God is this father, this higher being in this other realm who is all knowing and all wise and everything. And if we want anything, we better humble ourselves before that ultimate power. And then you're, you're lucky if God is going to bestow some grace on you. Um, instead of <laughs> the fact that maybe we're actually you know, aligned with God, maybe we're somehow on the same plane with this creative force, this loving energy that, that sustains this whole universe, that creates this whole experience, and that we are aligned with that. And that's what aligning with source means, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's the new paradigm. And that's the paradigm that Abraham is trying to teach us constantly with law of attraction. Mm -hmm. And, and the, what's happening is it is the way I see it is we're transitioning, we're transforming, we're transmuting an old paradigm belief system that, you know, that we are somehow at the mercy of the universe to an idea that we are creators in this universe. And so this idea of being playful is one of the first ones to, to get, uh, get good at and, they said with the old philosophy, we're never good enough. We're never, we're never lovable enough. And we're always separate from God and the hiring the heavens process on the contrary shows us that we're very extensions of that higher power of God himself, God herself, whatever you want to call source. And as such, we're always good enough. We're always lovable enough and we're never separate. Source wants us to experience joy and fulfillment through us and gives us unlimited support from the quote-unquote heavens to carry out the yearnings of our soul. Even so, staying in a constant state of exuberant creation and joy does not mean 
enjoying perpetual fun to the exclusion of other emotions. We've all had the experience of achieving something very difficult at the time that was anything but fun, yet in the end, it was worth every bit of the sweat. The joyous expression of our lives means we're free to experiment with the entire banquet of human emotions and in them find happiness and joy. It may seem strange, but in this frame of mind, we can even experience joy in frustration, joy in sadness, and joy in despair. The joy comes when we recognize that whatever situation we find ourselves in, it's only a role we are playing. This gives us a playful state of mind that's almost like witnessing ourselves in the third person. It's an observation point that makes us the performer, the producer, and even the audience. Imagine being asked to play a role in a movie where your character falls into the depths of despair. As an actor, you are challenged to dig deep within your creative soul to bring the expression of despair to the screen. But at the same time, you feel good about your ability to convey that particular emotion. Life is like that. Life is a play in which we have chosen a role. While we are the actor, we are also the director who playfully decides what will happen next. Even in the midst of our pain, we can find joy in our performance, realizing that, as so many wise teachers have said, we are, we truly are spiritual beings having human experiences. Take a step back and assess, assess your role that you are playing in your life. Don't identify with your pain and suffering so much. Recognize that even when tears are streaming down your face, your true self cherishes you and is honored to be experiencing life through your eyes. From this perspective, it's easier to move into a more pleasurable state. And one, of, and one of the best ways to do that is to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. Good, good advice. Be- Not always easy to do, but it's good advice. I mean, that's that's one of yeah. the the things that you know we know we have to do it, especially when we're in, when we're in that bad feeling place. But it, it can be a stretch sometimes to get there. You, sometimes you have to kind of apply yourself. You know? Well, yeah, I think that was a that's a a big one to say to somebody. Okay, you're suffering in your life. Um, remember that you're creating all this. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a and lot. That, I appreciate that. <laughs> and take just take take a step back and re, and just look at watch yourself doing all this, all creating all this pain, and ask yourself, uh, Wow, I, or, I'm really good at creating this pain. <laughs> <laughs> It's good to have a skill. <laughs> I actually have seen my life from this perspective, and um, and I think it is a an evolution that does take place within us, where we more and more. I mean, I guess I always now look at my life this way: that whatever is happening, I don't any longer kind of feel like I'm the victim of some external forces. But sometimes I do. You know, sometimes I wonder about that. Like I had a really intense dream last night. that was actually like a nightmare dream. I haven't had one of those for a really long time where I was being, you know, threatened by a very freaky being, you know, who looked like he was going to maybe eat me alive. Hmm. And it was like, it was like I woke up from that dream and, and my head was just filled with the sound of thousands of birds chirping, you know, and, and, you know, I have this high pierced ringing in my ear all the time. It's called tinnitus, I guess, by, mm-hmm. by by hearing doctors but oh, yes. i don't really think that's i don't call it that myself i call it um divine um divine guidance oh okay <laughs> because, well because i i use it to meditate on and then after i had this dream i thought man maybe i should quit using that sound to meditate on because it turned into this this chirping of thousands of birds that was kind of making me crazy and and I and I decided just not to go there. I decided, well, I'm not I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to just realize that I'm creating all this. I'm creating this dream. I'm creating this scary character in the stream, and I'm creating this high pierced sound in my ears. So, you know, yeah, it's probably a good idea. Whenever you, you realize that you're creating an Alfred Hitchcock movie in your head, it's probably a good idea to to change the subject. I have to agree with that because <laughs> you don't want to have well, to reenact the birds. <laughs> well, and and also realize that I'm not necessarily okay. I'm not necessarily at the effect of some um, evil spirit, right? right. Of something right. dark that is possessing me, and that is it could really, really freak me out or take advantage of me in some way or or kill me or make me suffer. I think that's one thing that maybe I know I've been afraid of in my life a lot is that there are these horrible external forces. And there's plenty of people who are of a religious persuasion who believe in things like like hell and a, and a devil and evil spirits. And there's plenty of indigenous people that will tell you in no uncertain terms that there's a tremendous amount of spirits that are completely capable of possessing us and destroying us in all kinds of different ways. And in the Abraham world of law of attraction, 
she basically, I mean, Abraham basically says, this isn't, this isn't the way it is. No. It's a so, different, different way of looking at things. And, and you're it right. Sure it, is. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the way it's normally presented. Personally, I like it a lot better. Partly Me because <laughs> I, I like the idea that there aren't a whole lot of these little, you know, devilish beings trying to tear my life down. But more importantly, I like it because it resonates better. It, it, it to put it another way, it spiritually makes sense to me. Yeah. The, the other, the other doesn't really make sense. I mean, I used to buy into it to a certain degree. Um, for my in my youngest years, I re- rejected it vehemently. But as time went on, and and I kept you know doing things the way society had taught me to do things, and not get anywhere and get frustrated and so forth. I did get to the point where I began to think that, you know, there was some evil force that was thwarting me at every possible turn. But when I heard the Abraham approach and what the Abraham's messages are along this line, I began to realize, oh, it was just me. I didn't realize I was doing that, but it was me. Yeah. It's not some evil force. It's not some mm-hmm. you know devil that's that's out to torture me. I, I set myself up and I didn't even know it. Yeah. So my goal yeah. now is well, I want to stop setting myself up that way. I want to start setting myself up to succeed, to have abundance and all that kind of thing. But at least you know it it had limited the field down to one participant. And when you do that, <laughs> it makes it a lot easier to handle. It really does. <laughs> Because, I mean, what are you going to do about a devil? You know, like, okay, devil, stay away. Here's my cross. You know, there's not a whole lot you can do, but you can can do something about yourself. That's where the empowering part comes in. Yeah, yeah. The, the whole thing of it being in, really in our court and that we're the, we're the creator of, of all of this stuff that we see and experience. It's like sort of like in the quantum physics uh, experiments over the last 70 years that they find that the observer – is the one that's really, really massively affecting how every experiment turns out because what the observer expects to see is what they end up seeing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and to to the degree that they're, they change little tweak, little things in the experiment and then expect to see that, then they get, they see that. And it seems, they seem to notice that the universe behaves according to our expectations. And, um, I, this guy who I've been studying who does out-of-body travel, he goes different places at night. He leaves his body, and his body's still there in bed, but he's out going to see friends at their house and traveling. I don't know where all, but um, I'm just getting into reading the book. But he said that on some of his early journeys, he he literally had to face his biggest demons. So he would leave his body, and he would get to the top of the stairs in his house and and he would realize that, that the stairs were now this long, dark pit into this really deep abyss of blackness. And then he would he would hear or see this um, this horrible, horrible monster down there. And it would be coming up the stairs. And he would know that it was going to completely devour him. And um, finally, he, he one time, you know, usually he would go back into his body. But one time he just stayed at the top of the stairs and this thing came up. And he just embraced it, and it just dissolved. It was nothing. Mm-hmm. And he realized that his greatest fears are really just his creations. You didn't actually describe it directly, but you hinted at something I have often wondered about. And maybe you have an insight about it. You hinted at how he went to visit friends. And when mm-hmm. you said that, it, that the hint part was, is, do people who do these kinds of journeys, the out-of-body experience journeys, do they ever meet during their journey other people who are doing the same kind of thing? Yes. Um, the the guys who have done the experiments on this to a great extent, scientific experiments, is the uh, Monroe Institute back in, I think, Virginia. And uh, so he hired quantum physicists and electronics experts and all kinds of different people. And the, the two particular ones who were pioneers with him was a quantum physicist and an and a, um, electronics engineer. And he would put them in separate chambers and they would be completely blindfolded and uh, separated from each other by um, partitions that I don't know if he used actual Faraday chambers, which are lined with lead and everything. So that there's no way that um, waves can transfer between the two chambers. But anyway, to make a long story short, they apparently um, both went, you know, they, these two guys were eventually able to rendezvous in the unseen realm outside of their bodies. And they were then able to go 
together and do simultaneously experience things the same and then come back and report after their journeys. And when they did separate recordings of each of them explaining their journey and then had them all listen to the recordings, they were explaining the exact same things. Very interesting. And, yeah. and I don't, I, I want to read more of uh, Bob Monroe's books and of, and some of these guys who did the guys who actually did these um, journeys. One of them has written a huge book um, called um, my big toe, which I mentioned in a previous podcast. Oh, that's which what is, that is. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a, it's like a 500 page book of, of his, th- his theory of everything. But he, in that he explains, and you can, a simpler way to hear how his explanation is just to go to uh, YouTube and just um, look up his, his work. And unfortunately I don't have his name right in front of me because I had to pack up all my books for my move, but um, I'll get his name. And, and it's, it's interesting. Yes, they, they did do enough experiments to convince these researchers that, Yes, you can you can have these experiences with other people and have it verified. That's and I, I don't know if they verified that by going into the homes of friends and having the friends verify that, you know, that they were there. That would have been um, good. Yeah, that would that yeah. would have been really good. Yeah. Because if you can do fun. that, that means that means you can appear spectrally. I mean, your body isn't physically there, so it has to be a spectral appearance, wouldn't it? I guess I don't know. I would imagine What's a spectral experience. Well, like you know, a ghost-like thing. You, you no substance oh. to it. You, you can't touch them, but you know, oh, you, can, oh. you can see. Or that some the... object was moved in the house, or, or oh, something okay, maybe something like that. I suppose that was convey that would convince. It's really funny that that we're mentioning this because my I had dinner with my um, my nephew's wife and and my nephew for the first time over the weekend. Or yeah, oh, it was last Saturday, and. <laughs> And I was expl- I was telling them some of these things about this auto body travel and stuff, and my niece just rolled her eyes and said, "Oh my God, not more of that." And I said, <laughs> "What do you mean?" And she says, "She says my dad has been into this stuff forever, and um, and he claims that he comes to see me all the time, and and he's really satisfied with our relationship, and he says he'll never fly here from Las Vegas to Denver to see me." Because he says he sees me all the time. He says, but I never see him oh. and I, and I miss him like crazy, but, but he thinks that we're in great touch because, because he says that in the, in his visits to me, we're in wonderful communication and everything's fine. <laughs> so he's communicating with her on some level where he feels really satisfied. It's just one doesn't. way. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so she's kind of frustrated by the whole idea. I can understand. Absolutely. Yeah. Because if she doesn't have the same experience, what good is it? It doesn't help her at all. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but you wonder if it maybe does, because um, if, if life is actually existing in multidimensional universes and other realms, then maybe all kinds of things are happening. I know the woman who wrote this book, um, Hiring the Heavens, she gives amazing examples of how it's changed her entire life. Um, to where she she can rely on on these entities from this other realm to j- do all kinds of stuff for her, and it's made her life this completely uh, wonderful, easy experience. That, that's all good. I, I think I'm still on the niece's side, though. I mean, if I were her, I'd want to know that I was having the experience, and not have somebody tell me, "Well, you've had the experience." Oh you know, yeah, so, so just live with it. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> no, yeah, no, 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 no. We're here to have the experience. So come on, let's go. Especially your own father. Yeah, you know, that's the the in the in the three D realm, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 But the interesting thing about this book is that she's saying this does occur in the three D realm. You know, these things happen. Mm. Um like here's a guy who uh Stephen decided to hire the heavens before a trip to Yosemite National Park with his wife. They plan to go there on retreat, and so they practically they particularly wanted to their stay to be peaceful and in tune with nature, knowing that Yosemite can be very crowded before leaving Stephen hired, hired a spiritual park ranger and requested that their campsite be a quiet, sacred place. Later, he reported that their trip was absolutely magical and exquisitely peaceful. In fact, during their entire four days there, they heard a dog bark twice and didn't cross paths with a single human soul. Um, that's one example. Here's uh Rachel found that you can you can even hire for someone else. Her twelve year old 
son, Logan, chose to do a school report on Joe Montana, but he couldn't find any information at the school library. So Rachel drove him to the city library and waited outside with her two-year-old daughter while Logan searched inside. After about an hour, he returned almost crying because he couldn't find any books on Joe Montana. Rachel calmly told him to go back inside and look one more time. As he reluctantly turned to go back inside, she quickly hired a spiritual homework assistant to go with him and help him find the book he needed. Three minutes later, Rachel entered the library to see Logan at the checkout counter with an 18 by 11 inch book with a picture of Joe and the title Montana on the cover in big, bold letters. Where did you find this? She asked incredulously. His eyes wide, Logan spoke as if he couldn't believe what he was about to say. I went back to the sports section and I thought to myself, what if a book fell behind the racks? So I poked my head inside the rack and saw a big book on its edge. I reached down and pulled up this book. (laughs) And she has story after story in this book, even how she wrote this entire book by, by asking for help from the unseen realm and how all this stuff came together for her that she never knew how to do. She never had any idea how she was going to write a book and how it was all going to take place and how she even finds all kinds of help in the 3D realm in the form of people that show up in her life miraculously that then help her in every way she needs help and make these things unfold in her life. So this this is interesting also because it reminds me of an interview that I did very early on in this podcast, one of the first 15 or 20 episodes. Uh, I interviewed a gentleman named Bill Guggenheim, who Mm -hmm. has written a number of books on the subject of communications with the other world. With the, with the non-physical. Um, one of his books was called Hello from Heaven. And in his books, he talked about how if he wanted to, uh, say, get an education about economics, he'd call upon the spirit of Milton Friedman and get a conversation going on in his head with Milton Friedman. Or yeah. if, you know, if he wanted to learn more about the theory of relativity, he'd call on Albert Einstein. Or if he wanted to learn more about uh, Jesus of Nazareth, he'd call on Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, he would just call on all these different people and and learn stuff and communicate stuff with them and and have all these conversations. The the only bad part about the interview is Bill is not exactly the most dynamic guy in the world, so it's a little bit of a slow interview. But other than that, the, the information is very similar to what you're talking about here. Kind of a different approach in a way, but very similar. Yeah, and let's and let's take this back since we're just about done with time. Like to the thing that we began the the podcast with, which is that there's this huge spike in the amount of people who are having being clinically depressed True. and there's a, yeah. mm-hmm. there's huge spike in the amount of amphibians that are dying all around mm. the world now is is it possible that if if we as human beings have this capability to tap into this unseen realm and that that unseen realm is tapped into the the energy that keeps the planet spinning and that keeps everything in the entire universe that that creates life you know and that and that gives us breath and that gives us our bodies and, you know, filled with 70 trillion cells that are all cooperating to give us our health and everything that makes life what life is and the universe what it is. What if we could tap into that energy and receive the blessings and the help and the abundance of this whole universe? Maybe these these things that we call really intense problems could be addressed in ways that we could find ease, we could find solutions, we could find a way to be more in harmony with the way it works, and we would be less apt to create this idea that we're separate here struggling on this earth in such an intense way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I really believe this is a huge element we're missing. Well, it also makes me want to ask you a question, because um, since there apparently is quite a bit of power in engaging this, basically hiring people in the unseen realm to help us out. And I know you've done channeling and other kinds of outreach. Have you hired anybody? Have have you had any experiences along the line of hiring somebody and asking for help and uh, getting that help delivered? Um, Yes, I've had many, many experiences of feeling that things like that come about for me, but I, I would need to handle that in the next show because we're out of time. Um, yeah, that's true. There's probably more than we can do in 10 minutes, isn't it? <laughs> oh, oh, we have 10 minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought yeah. we were down to um, the very end. Oh, no, no. no we got no, about 10 minutes left. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. So how it, how it works for me is more um, 
I, you know, like, can I think of an, a specific instance right at this moment? No, I can't think of one. I should write them down when they occur because they do occur often. Um, really? Wow. Ask, well, yeah. I mean, I feel like, and maybe you feel the same way, is that throughout my day, I notice serendipity happening again and again and again and again and again and again. I mean, I, it's just endlessly happening in my life where, you know, I'll go over to, to look at some song that's on Spotify and the list of songs and, and they'll, you know, this happened recently and like, like every name of, a, of the songs is naming something that I'm thinking about right at that moment that I'm dealing with and struggling with. Mm-hmm. And each, each name of the song is some, aspect of that thing that that's up for me um you know just just all kinds of things show up like like particular courses might show up on the internet and might come in through an email that's exactly the thing that i'm needing and i'm thinking about do i really maybe that's something i need in my life it, it's basically just a law of attraction you know like what i'm vibrating with keeps showing up in my life but is it is it a blessing is it that's how i relate it to the realm of the of the unseen of the divine is, is it's, it's a, it's a nice blessing. You know, that's when life becomes easy for me is when I see that, that the things that I need and want and, and really want to have unfold in my life are coming to me. And here's a little sign of it. And here's another little sign of it. Abraham calls it driftwood evidence, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, like that as you, as you're walking down the beach and you're seeing all this driftwood on on the beach, it you could say it's evidence that there's a forest someplace. You know, if <laughs> if you're going through a whole lot of bullshit in your life, it's evidence that there's a horse in there somewhere. <laughs> I mean, uh, horse shit in your life, it's an evidence there's there a horse. Yeah, I get the right <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> but, but, but uh, you know, it's it's like, uh, well, isn't that a funny? Haven't you heard that story about the at the little girl digging? Oh digging yeah, all the all the horse shit. And there's, she said, there must be a pony. There's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's an example of, of trusting contrast, you know, which is kind of like, you know, you, even when things are going not so great for you, you trust that there is a divine purpose here. There's something wonderful unfolding and you're going to follow the thread of it. But I just noticed that in conversations with people, um, you know, the particular person that calls me at that moment, the particular person I feel inspired to call, and then I listen to the conversation we're having, it's, oh, yeah, that's telling me this. That's exactly what I, I knew if I talked to Shannon, that she would she would probably go on to this tangent, and she would talk to me about this in a way that I would get help, and there it is, here it comes. I'm not even asking her for the help, but, <laughs> but you know, I knew that if, and, and, and Or Shannon just happened to call me right at that moment. And of course, she then gives me this great insight. Things like that, right? I mean, doesn't that happen to you all day long? Yeah. Well, once you frame it that way, I I was expecting you to say something about how I I was expecting that you would somehow be describing how you connected with person X and person X from the unseen realm gave you uh, an answer. But you weren't really Uh thinking of it in terms of who is providing the information. You're you're simply seeing, oh, look at all this information that's being provided. That's the evidence. And that's good. I can see that. Yeah. I I was just kind of expecting there'd be like a a personality behind it. But apparently it doesn't have to be. In my channeling, I've I've asked I've asked in my channeling for a personality to reveal itself to me. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, and I haven't really gotten any real clear explanation of a of an actual personality type. Like some people say, I channel Saint Germain. I challenge. I channel Michael, um, the Archangel, Archangel Michael. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, I channel Albert Einstein. Or whatever. you know, it's <laughs> like uh, people claim to channel Michael Abraham. You know, right? Um, Council of Radiant Light, the uh, the communion of light. This I know two a channeler who channels the Council of Radiant Light, one who channels the communion of light, one who channels Hermes. You know, there's different people out there who are claiming. And you know what? Some of these people, when I listen to them, they blow my mind because um, <laughs> they're very psychic. You know, some people and they and they say, "Well, my guides." You know, I'm even in a conversation. They say, "My guides just told me that." that that's not the way it is. And that actually what's going to happen is this, you know, I was listening to a a psychic on a phone call a few weeks ago and she was saying mind blowing things. It made me think, man, I got to write down this woman's name and, and think of hiring her for an hour, a discussion because she's 
got so much amazing insight that seems like she's really connected. Like and what? Can think, you think of anything in particular that she might have said? I mean, I, yeah, I know it's always um, hard to do that on the, the spur of the moment. Well, but. one thing, one thing, she was she was going on and on for about a half an hour about how her guides are telling her that in the future we're not going to have money any longer, and how all this trans, all the way we're moving towards Bitcoin and all these things are are simply a, a um, transition we're in to a, a living entirely without anything that we now call money. And that we're going to be living in the future in a, in a whole different way that's, that humans relate to each other. And um, it'll be just some other kind of a, a give and take happening in, in society. I can see and, that happening. That, that actually does yeah. make sense to me from an economic point of view, believe it or yeah. not. I, yeah. I could see how that would actually happen. And if, if you had asked me that 40 years ago, I would have said you were nuts. No way that can happen. But now, 40 years after 40 plus years of studying this stuff... I mean, if you really count it as a lifetime, 60 plus years, I can see how that would work. Mm-hmm. And, and I like the fact that I can see how that would work. That That's actually mm-hmm. a nice thing. There was a time when I thought that was impossible. And it was also a little bit depressing to think that because, mm-hmm. uh, well, it's like any other limiting belief, right? We we're, we're, we talk about that a lot with law of attraction and with being a deliberate creator and so forth, that, how, that our, our limiting beliefs is the collection of things that stops us from Know, completing the manifestation of stuff that that we want to bring into our lives, and and the more that we explore what limiting beliefs we have, and the more we stumble across them, the more we realize, wow, there are a lot of them. Well, money is a limiting belief, a- and look at all the limiting beliefs that are associated with it. Look, look how many people are interested in money and look interested in attracting money. Why? Because they've been blocking it. They, there are so many different limiting beliefs that they have, that we all have, that we use to block the flow of money. So, of course, we're interested in, in acquiring more of it. So, mm-hmm. you know, as we are in a process of removing limiting beliefs, those of us who are, you know, practicing, studying to be deliberate creators, the less limiting beliefs there are going to be. Well, I can kind of play that out. I can extrapolate and say, well, yeah, eventually we get the point where enough limiting beliefs are gone that we just don't feel like we have the need for money anymore. How exactly right. does that play out? I, I can't say exactly how it plays out, but I can say that the more limiting beliefs we get rid of, the fewer that are, are still hanging around, the more abundance everybody has. The more abundance people have, the less they worry about money. It's just not that mm-hmm. important anymore. It doesn't even hardly play a role after a while. I mean, mm-hmm. you, if you talk to somebody who has, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, you'll find some of them who are, you know, very uh, scared about it. You know, they're they're constantly guarding it and so forth. But there are others, they, they just don't even think about it. It's not even yeah. part of their, their mindset anymore. And they're mm-hmm. the ones, of course, who tend to not only keep it, but expand the amount of money that they have access, you know, at their, at their fingertips. Um, but, yeah, I mean... For for the people who are in business who are billionaires, most of those billionaires aren't in business to just make money. That That's like the last thing they're really interested in. Money is simply how they do the stuff that they want to do. And that's all. It has no other role in their mindset. They're the ones who are out there creating all the new stuff. They're yeah. the ones that are creating all the, yeah. the new things. And, and they're loving that part. You know, and then they let the accountants worry about the money. <laughs> That's all they do. <laughs> right, right, right. And and a lot of people say that the way you really allow money into your life is by not um, not focusing on having the money, but focusing on the work you want to do and being of exactly being of service, or you know, uh, as Abraham would even say, being being in joy, being being playful, having fun in the work that you do, and. Um, you know, doing it to uplift, doing it to uh, make others' lives easier, and more fun, and make your own life easier and more fun. And then, the, you know, once you're in that place and you're really flowing with that, money just flows in that towards that. You know, because money is more like air or water; it really is, it really is able to flow smoothly in the direction of ease and and that follows the path of least resistance, just like everything does, you know, the root of a tree, the path of a river, everything in nature follows the path of least resistance. And that's, if we keep, if we believe that the evolution of the human species is, and, and of all the species on earth are following the path of least resistance, then everything that's happening right now in the, all the contrast we're seeing really is, is a path of least resistance. It is. Unfortunately, the only resistance we have left is that we're out of time in the show. So we'll have to carry it out on, mm-hmm. on Monday. But uh, Tom, have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you then. All right. Well, thank you. 
And we'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.